we're going to open the abdomen, uh, examine some of the structure of the peritoneal cavity, including the mesenteries, and also take a look at the inguinal region and the femoral region. Now, the first step in this process is to reflect some of the anterior abdominal wall muscles, such as rectus abdominis that you did in a previous dissection, and then to make a large X-shaped incision through the anterior abdominal wall. And now we've removed the umbilicus in this cadaver, but make that cut of the X just above the umbilicus so that later we can watch how the umbilical vessels uh, come to and from the umbilicus. Now, if you reflect these flaps back, you can see that there are two layers to the peritoneal sac, just like there were up in the chest for the pleural and pericardial sacs. And we've left a piece of the parietal peritoneum, a nice filmy layer here, the outer layer of the peritoneal sac. There is a layer of connective tissue called transversalis fascia that would bind this parietal peritoneum to all the inner surfaces of the abdominal and pelvic cavities. Now, if we pull that back, you can appreciate the visceral layer of the peritoneal sac that is coating all the internal organs. Now, for all these organs to re receive their adequate blood supply, there are structures called mesenteries where the peritoneum is going to form a double layer that the vessels and nerves can run through to approach all of these organs and provide them with the innervation and the blood supply that they need. Now, to get better exposure of the abdominal cavity, so that you can see in here. Uh, I'm going to do something that's really not part of the dissection, but will help us expose the abdomen better, and that is to cut off some of these dangling abdominal wall muscles so that we can see down inside as we're trying to instruct you how to do the dissection here. Now that the abdomen is opened well, we can see some of the derivatives of the embryonic mesenteries. Remember from the embryology lectures that the ventral mesentery only persists in the region of the foregut, that portion of the digestive tract that continues down through about the you know, first or second portion of the duodenum. So beyond that level, at the levels of the mid and hindguts, there will be no ventral mesentery. Now here we can see the adult derivatives of the ventral mesogastrium, or mesentery of the foregut, I'm pulling back the ventral body wall here, and there's a portion of that mesentery that continues down to the liver. It's called the falciform ligament. And there seems to be some scar tissue in this cadaver so that it's shrunken up and a little bit more uh, tight than it is on most cadavers. But this falciform ligament would be a portion of the ventral mesentery. And the liver develops within that ve ventral mesentery, so we'll see another portion of it spanning between the liver and the main gut tube, the stomach and the duodenum at this level. Okay, so this derivative of the ventral mesogastrium is called the les lesser omentum. And I'm sticking my finger through an opening called the epiploic foramen. So all the tissue between my finger, which you can't see, and right about in here is called the lesser omentum. Now this is all stomach. And you can't really see it visually necessarily, but the sphincter between the stomach and the duodenum is right about here. You feel a nice, dense thickening of the smooth muscle there in the wall of the organ. So that this portion of the lesser omentum spanning between the liver and the stomach is the hepatogastric ligament, whereas this portion, a little bit uh, more toward the right, spanning between the liver and the duodenum is the hepatoduodenal ligament. And that in particular is important because it's got the structures of the portal triad contained within it, the common bile duct, the hepatic artery, and the hepatic portal vein. Now the rest of the mesenteries that we're going to see are all derivatives of the dorsal mesenteries that develop originally. And there's a very prominent specialization of the dorsal mesentery of the foregut here. It's called the greater omentum. It's attached to the greater curvature of the stomach, and then balloons out and forms this apron-like structure hanging down over many of the other abdominal organs. Now let's pull up the greater omentum and we can catch a glimpse of the transverse colon portion of the large intestine coming across and it's got its own dorsal mesentery. This would be the transverse mesocolon extending from the posterior body wall up to the transverse colon. 
And in the next dissection, what we're going to find is as we peel apart the layers of these different mesenteries, we're going to expose the blood vessels that supply them. Okay, the last major mesentery that you can find within the cadaver is the dorsal mesentery of the small intestine, the so-called mesentery proper. And again, when we peel apart the layers of this mesentery, we'll see very elaborate blood supply and nerve supply innervating all of these different organs. We're going to take you on a quick tour of the abdominal organs, just so you have seen them and are oriented and find them in your own cadaver. Of course, we've got the stomach here in the upper left quadrant, and we've already taken a look at the liver, and this would be the gallbladder tucked underneath its inferior edge. Now let's follow along the length of the GI tract, and we've got the stomach. Again, you can't necessarily see it, but you can palpate that pyloric sphincter that separates the stomach from the duodenum. And I can follow the duodenum a certain distance, but then it disappears where it travels right along the posterior abdominal wall and will cross to the opposite side. So to find it, again, we need to pull the transverse colon out of the way. And now here on the left side, we've got the duodenum coming back into view. And as soon as we get a mesentery established, we make the transition from duodenum to jejunum. So looking at all these loops of small bowel, about half of it is jejunum, and then the second half of it would be the ileum. And we're not really concerned about looking at these grossly and making the distinction between ileum and jejunum. Just realize about half is jejunum, about half is ileum. Now as you follow the ileum along, you're going to come to an abrupt uh, increase in diameter where we reach the end of the small intestine and the beginning of the large intestine or colon. And where this happens, there's always a segment of the large intestine that hangs down or pooches down a little bit. That's called the cecum. And often, this is where you're going to find the appendix dangling down, right at the ileocecal junction. Now, from what we've seen, there is no appendix in this cadaver, but that's where you should expect to find it if the cadaver's got one that hasn't been removed. So that would be the, the home of the appendix. And now we're going to see that the large intestine travels up along the right side of the body. This would be the ascending colon. And then travels across the body as the transverse colon. And then travels inferiorly or descends on the left side of the body as the descending colon. Now, in this particular cadaver, the descending colon is very small. It's probably about as big as one of my fingers in diameter and normally it's at least a couple of inches in diameter. So there seems to be some obstruction in this cadaver. You, you would normally find something larger. Now notice as I've been flipping organs around here, some of the organs are really plastered against the posterior body wall. And these are organs, such as the descending colon, that have lost their mesenteries and have become retroperitoneal, or have assumed this position behind the parietal peritoneum. And as you go through your dissection, try to identify those organs that have lost their mesenteries and are now secondarily retroperitoneal. Following down the descending colon, the next segment that would we, we would find is the sigmoid colon. And again, the diameter of the sigmoid colon in this individual seems to be uh, quite reduced. We do establish a mesentery again with the sigmoid colon. And then as that organ straightens out and heads down into the pelvis, we get to the level of the rectum. For the next part of dissection six, we're going to consider descent of the testis and ovary and how they affect the layers of the anterior abdominal wall. So just as a reminder here, the most superficial layer of muscle that you see would be the external abdominal oblique. And if you follow it medially, you see the aponeurosis, that broad, flat tendon continuing toward the midline, helping to form the rectus sheath over the rectus abdominis muscle. Now focus at the inferior edge of this aponeurosis, which is attached to two bony landmarks. One, the anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS, and medially to a bump on the pubis called the pubic tubercle. And this inferior edge, again, spanning between those bony landmarks is called the inguinal ligament. Now examine this aponeurosis carefully, and what you'll see is there's a thin spot down toward the medial inferior edge of it, and that is where there's a defect in the aponeurosis where the spermatic cord passes through. 
Now the spermatic cord is a structure that contains vessels, ducts, lymphatics, nerves, all that are going to serve the testis that were dragged down along during the process of descent. And a similar process does happen in the female as well. So this defect in the external abdominal oblique aponeurosis where the spermatic cord emerges superficially is called the superficial inguinal ring. And it's literally an opening in the external oblique aponeurosis. Now if we reflect this layer to examine how the descent process affects the deeper layers of the abdominal wall, the next layer of course that we'll encounter is the internal abdominal oblique muscle. And let's just pull the inguinal ligament down a bit more. Now we've got the spermatic cord as it's traveling through the body wall in a structure called the inguinal canal. As you can see, the inferior edge of the internal oblique muscle is right about at the level where the descent is occurring. So a few of the muscle fibers from the internal oblique are dragged along and cover the surface of the spermatic cord as it continues down toward the testis. This is called the cremaster muscle. Now we've reflected the external abdominal oblique aponeurosis and again are looking at the internal oblique. Now what we can't see from this angle is the deepest layer of the abdominal wall musculature, the transversus abdominis, although uh, its inferior border is higher than that of the internal abdominal oblique, so it's really not affected in any way by the descent of the testis. And it's not going to help form any of the layers that surround the spermatic cord ultimately. But what will happen is, as both the transversus abdominis and internal oblique muscles pass medially, their aponeuroses will fuse with each other, forming a structure called the conjoint tendon. Now, if I put a probe or a pen behind this layer, you can see the inferior edge of the internal oblique muscle right here, and then a thin spot below it. Now, this thicker edge where it's not only the internal oblique but also the transversus abdominis aponeurosis fused curving down to attach to the pubis is called the conjoint tendon and this thin spot below the conjoint tendon is a region where the abdominal wall is only reinforced by peritoneum and a thin layer of connective tissue called the transversalis fascia so that this thin weak spot is prone to hernias that type of a hernia would be called a direct inguinal hernia where some type of abdominal content protrudes similar to how the pen is protruding here through that weak spot and it can enlarge and ultimately continue out through the superficial inguinal ring. Now we've changed the camera angle to more of a superior view so that we could see some of the structures and the abdominal wall layers as we follow the spermatic cord deep and again just for orientation we've got the external oblique musculature and its aponeurosis, the inferior edge being the inguinal ligament, and the superficial inguinal ring where the spermatic cord has passed through that most superficial layer of the abdominal wall. Now let's lay back the external oblique aponeurosis. And again, we can see the spermatic cord which is traveling through the inguinal canal at this point and get a glimpse of some of those muscle fibers from the internal oblique that have been dragged along with the spermatic cord down toward the testis. The inferior edge of the internal oblique muscle is right here and we can follow that medially where it becomes aponeurotic and really is fused also with the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle. Now the distinction between that thick tissue and the thinner tissue below it, which is simply transversalis fascia, is more evident if we put something dark behind, which you can see right through that thinner transversalis fascia tissue. Now what I'm going to do is reflect this layer, and we can start looking at the layers from the inside. Now, As I pull this up, you can see uh, right here, this thin layer, this weakened layer, where hernias are more likely to happen uh, just due to the weakness of that portion of the anterior abdominal wall. Now let's lay this all the way out so we can see what's happening on the inside with the muscular layers. Once we do get to the inside, now we're looking at the rectus abdominis muscle and one of its two vessels, 
that provides uh, nutrients and oxygen. Coming from the inferior end, this would be the inferior epigastric vessel. And remember that there was also a superior epigastric set of vessels that were derivatives of the internal thoracic or internal mammary. Now let's follow the spermatic cord deep. And at this point, we can see the components of the spermatic cord emerging inside the body. These components are separating and heading off in different directions. This is the vas deferens or the ductus deferens, which is diving down into the pelvis. And these are the vessels, the testicular vessels, that are providing the oxygen and nutrients to the testis, which is now isolated within the scrotum. So it's generally pretty easy to identify this territory where the structures are emerging on the inside. It's known as the deep inguinal ring because you can see those components of the spermatic cord diverging. The other pretty straightforward way to find the location of the deep inguinal ring is to simply find the inferior epigastric vessels and just lateral to those is where the deep inguinal ring forms. Okay. And what this is, is that original site in the anterior abdominal wall where the testis started to push through the wall and drag along its nerve, blood supply, and duct system. Okay. Now normally, this entire pathway of descent of the testis becomes closed off after birth. I can put a probe through the entire pathway at this point simply because we've dissected it open. So on this end, we've got the probe coming out through the deep inguinal ring. Okay. If I go back through the layering, now we've got the probe coming through the inguinal canal. And then if we were to follow the entire pathway, it would come out through the superficial ring, like so. Occasionally, we don't get closure, normal closure of this inguinal canal so that this would be another potential site of a hernia. Again, we might have a loop of small bowel that's moving around and can make its way down through that path of descent, right through the inguinal canal, and if it gets large enough, ultimately emerging through the superficial inguinal ring. This would be called an indirect inguinal hernia because it's traveling obliquely through the anterior abdominal wall. We've moved to the camera to yet another angle now, uh, sitting at the head of the cadaver and looking down at the inguinal region so we can get yet another view of what's happening down here. And I've left the probe uh, right in the inguinal canal. So this would simulate the pathway of an indirect inguinal hernia that would originate here at the deep inguinal ring, which is just lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. It would pass through the inguinal canal, right through the layers of the body wall, as you see here, and then emerge, if it got large enough, at the superficial inguinal ring. So keep that pathway in mind as the indirect inguinal hernia, because we want to compare that to the pathway of the direct inguinal hernia, which rather than passing obliquely through the body wall, pretty much goes straight out perpendicular to the surface. Now if I bring this back and forth a bit, again, you can distinguish this thin spot in the anterior body wall that would be below the level of the conjoint tendon, where the internal abdominal oblique and transversus tendons are angling in medially to attach to the pubis. At this point, the only thing we've got in place is that thin transversalis fascia and the parietal peritoneum. Now let's lay this back and take a look at some of the landmarks inside that you can identify. Okay. Of course, I'm holding up the rectus abdominis muscle. And again, we see its inferior epigastric blood supply. And we can define boundaries of this weak zone in the abdominal wall where the direct hernia is likely to happen. Okay. There's a region called the inguinal triangle that it, it most commonly happens in, and the boundaries of that triangle are formed by the inferior epigastric vessels, the lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle, and then the inguinal ligament below. Okay? And certainly you can, you can distinguish that that's a thin area so that I can push my finger against the superficial surface and you don't really see much, but if I push it against 
that weak zone, the inguinal triangle, it's pretty clear that that's a thinner, weaker area. And that is where you'd have a direct inguinal hernia. In the last part of dissection six, we're going to look at another weak region in the anterior abdominal wall that is prone to hernias. We've already talked extensively about the inguinal region and the different kinds of hernias that can occur there, the direct and indirect. And now what we're going to discuss is a region uh, where the vessels and nerves are exiting the abdomen to get to the thigh where they're going to supply the lower limb. So just for orientation, you can see kind of the low magnification view here. And again, we're going to reflect the layers of the anterior abdominal wall. And as a reminder, we've got our rectus abdominis muscle here with one of its two vessels that supply it, this one, the inferior epigastric artery. Okay. And remember that just lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels is where you form the deep inguinal ring, where the testis and its trailing structures pass through the anterior abdominal wall. Now to expose this other weak area better, what we're going to do is cut through the spermatic cord and thread it up through the inguinal canal so that we can see some of the other structures better. So we're pulling the spermatic cord up through the inguinal canal and we'll reflect that for you. Now what we can see better is uh, the set of structures that are going to enter the thigh to supply the lower limb. Now starting laterally and working our way medially, use the mnemonic navel to remember the order that these uh, structures are positioned in. Navel for nerve, artery, vein, and then an empty space which contains lymphatic vessels and some fat. Okay. The nerve is the femoral nerve. The artery at this point is the external iliac artery, a branch of the aorta. The vein is the external iliac vein. And then we've got this empty space. Once the vessels cross into the thigh, you're going to change their name and start calling them the femoral vessels. Now, whereas the inguinal canal was found just above the inguinal ligament, what we see here is that this weak spot is just below the inguinal ligament. Okay, now, holding up these layers, this is the edge of the inguinal ligament. Okay, and these structures are passing just below it to get down into the thigh. Okay, now, take a careful look at the inguinal ligament, as it comes down to attach to the pubis, it forms this curved portion. So the boundaries of this empty space, which is really the weak area, are bounded by the inguinal ligament, this curved ligament, and then some fibers that are attached right to the pubis itself. So another region where hernias are likely to occur is right through this area, okay, this compartment just medial to the vein because there's not a lot of resistance there. It's simply some fat and some lymphatics that are going to pass to and from the thigh in that region. Okay. We've got nice, tight, firm boundaries to this femoral canal so that if you do get a, a loop of small bowel herniating into that region, it can get constricted and trapped in there and not regress as easily as it does from an inguinal hernia.